There's one thing that both YouTube comments and Muslim scholars make clear. Islam thrives on ignorance. That strategy worked fine for the first 1300 years of Islam, when the world was largely isolated when people could live their whole lives and only come in contact with members of their own community. But things are changing. Cracks, gaping holes even, are forming in the dam of the Islamic narrative. Islamic scholars do have a proposed solution to the problem, though. Better education to spread the truth, perhaps? Not a chance. In Islam, it's all about censorship. Over the past few weeks, critics of Islam have seized on rare moments of honesty by Muslim apologists. Moments where they subtly admit the popular Islamic narrative is built on deception and half-truths. My fellow laborers have done a great job with that, so I felt no need to comment. However, the Muslim response has forced me into action. Instead of refuting the critics, popular Muslim apologists have resorted to censorship, both of themselves and attempts to censor critics as well. Censorship is one thing I can't stand for, so here we are. First, I'll look at some of the cowardice, then I'll examine the root cause, none other than Islam itself. A couple weeks ago, Yasser Qadi was interviewed on Muhammad Hijab's channel. He spoke candidly about issues he had never discussed before, specifically trying to set the record straight about his doubts. Unfortunately for him, it was a live stream, and he ended up saying a lot of damaging stuff as he rambled and waffled trying to explain the situation without saying anything specific. That is, he kept trying to discuss a major problem in the Islamic narrative without revealing any details. His attempts to reveal nothing ended up revealing a lot about how Islam operates and created a bigger problem than any specific hole could. Let's look at a few of his comments. This is a topic that when you're the beginning, beginning student of knowledge, you're like, what is all of this going on here? When you go a little bit more, you learn to simply memorize what your teachers say and regurgitate it out. And you don't fully comprehend. When you do a deep dive, is when things get very, very awkward and difficult. And this isn't new. This is from the time of the Sahaba. Why didn't I say it? Because it should not be said in public. These are very, very difficult issues. And the most advanced of our scholars, they're not quite fully certain how to solve all of the unanswered yeah. questions in there. I don't want to get yeah. into that issue. Okay, fine. Why do I not want to get to that issue? Here's the point. In a Muslim environment, there's always some respect that we have for the Quran. We should. In a Muslim environment, we'll press a little bit and then we'll say, okay, khalas, sami'na wa ta'ala. And that's great, alhamdulillah. When you go to academia, they don't have that red line. And they're going to just, you know, the, 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 the famous story of the emperor with no clothes. They're going to just point out, no, that doesn't make any sense. Well, that's not true. And this and that. And they'll bring issues, which I'm not going to mention explicitly, that you know are true because they're in your own books. They're not inventing anything new. They'll bring you riwayat and they'll bring you athar and then you add to that very well-known issues of, I don't even want to be explicit. And then you bring on top of that makhtutat and then and then. And it's very clear to you and to every single very advanced student and specialist that the standard narrative has holes in it. That's what I'm going to say. The standard narrative does not answer some very pressing questions. As you can see, he's trying real hard not to say anything. But he does say that even the scholars don't really know the answers to the questions he has in mind. And he advises Muslims not to discuss such matters. Zakir Naik said something similar this week in response to being asked what's the most difficult question he ever faced. This I only discuss with the scholars and the fuqahas. And I asked them what is the answer and I asked this to maybe uh, 50 or 100 people who are scholars and people of knowledge. And, and, and unfortunately, the most difficult questions have not been answered. So 50 or 100 top scholars of Islam all have no answer to this question. 
Of course, Knight claims he has one, but refuses to give the question or the answer, saying he won't discuss the matter in public. As far as the most difficult question is concerned, because it's not a very common question, I will never tell it to the masses, to the public. Because such questions can are so difficult, so attacking, and if it's not common, why should I make it public? Alhamdulillah, I have the answer. Kadi, however, was live and perhaps accidentally revealed some of his most difficult question. What was the crisis? The crisis was very simple. And by the way, this is now a well-known open secret amongst many Muslim graduate students and, and, and academics around the world. And yeah. this is well-known. Traditional understandings of Ahruf and Qiraat cannot answer some of these pressing questions that are now being poked by our uh, people outside of, by our academics, not our, by their academics outside of the faith tradition. This issue uh, of Ahruf and Qiraat has troubled the Ummah from the very beginning of time. It's nothing new. And there are 15 opinions about this. None of them fully answer all of the questions that are raised. Some of them answer more than others. And then partially stated his answer. If someone gave you a Quran which is empty in terms of there's, no, there's nothing on it, would what you write in that Mus'haf correspond with any, I'm not saying it's a mutawatir, I'm saying would it, would it be sahih, authentic, would it correspond with anything that we have? But which qira will it be in? It'll be probably a mixture, right? It's not going to be That's necessarily... Fine. Yeah, okay, so let's leave it at that then. It's, gonna, it's not going to be the exact Hafsa and Asim bi riwayati Fulan or Shu'ba. This is something that is coming at a later stage, okay? okay. The codification of the Qira'at is coming in the second, third century. Let me translate. None of the 30-something different Arabic Qur'ans available today exactly match the original Qur'an. But Qadi thinks he's determined the original text and will publish on it soon. Of course, Muslims have been publicly proclaiming for years that the Quran has been perfectly preserved right down to the letter, and this miracle is proof that Islam is true. One of those copies is even today present in Koptaki Museum in Istanbul. So this, and if you check it with today's Musaf, it is exactly the same, word to word, letter to letter. That's the way, even if you try to change it, you cannot Kadi admits that the common beliefs about perfect preservation are wrong, if not outright lies. Lies that many Muslims' faith is based upon. And he's not alone. A few weeks ago, Shabir Ali made a similar admission, noting that the Hafs Quran used by most Muslims today dates only from 1924, and the manuscripts contain many variants. Today, most Muslims read the Quran in a text that is referred to as the Egyptian edition of 1924. But this is not the only text of the Quran that is read throughout the world. Uh, there uh, is another reading of the Quran and a matching manuscript that is uh, prevalent. And here, too, we find some slight variations. In the time of the Prophet Muhammad and whom be peace, the precise words, which, which are the vehicles uh, through which the, the important teachings are being disseminated, were not so important. So one Muslim would go tell another one, look, uh, we got a new teaching in the form of the Quran. And the other one is asking, what does the Quran say? And then he repeats the saying and the teaching of the Quran uh, without necessarily uh, getting precisely the same words uh, in which they were first delivered by the Prophet Muhammad and whom be peace. So there was this period in which uh, Muslims had the opportunity to teach others the Quran no, without insisting on the precise words. Here's another clip, this one by Shah Azad Salim, where he admits that the Islamic histories teach that portions of the Quran have been lost. These verses from among the Quran were from among the Quran when the Prophet died, and we obviously, as I said, these no longer exist. So these two are very uh, prominent and glaring examples which testify to the fact that. Uh, the Quran we, we have today, if we, if, if we go by these narratives, is incomplete. And as Qadi says, this isn't a new question, but one that goes back to the very beginning of Islam. Indeed, early Muslims openly discussed these issues. Take a look at this list of textual critics of the Quran. 
The publication dates obscure it, but do you see something odd? Yes, almost all the sources date from the 13th or 14th century. The few that don't are mostly reprints of works from that era or earlier. Why is this? It seems that shortly after this period, someone figured out it was better to lie about perfect preservation than to cause doubts by being truthful. A nice-sounding lie was worth more than the supposed words of God himself. Keep the people ignorant to keep them in Islam. That's all that matters. And this is hardly an isolated issue. There are many similar lies taught as fact in Islam. For example, here's Qadi addressing the claim that Islam was spread peacefully. Please don't quote me Malaysia and Maldives and whatnot. Please don't say, oh, look at those. Because firstly, there were exceptions. And secondly, do you know how those exceptions occurred? Trading. That's what they teach you in Sunday school. MashaAllah, your whole knowledge of Islam comes from Sunday school. Their rulers converted to Islam. When their rulers converted to Islam, the people were essentially socially forced to follow. Sometimes politically, by the way, but socially forced to follow. But my dear brothers and sisters, because of the internet, we don't have the luxury to be in our beautiful bubbles anymore. Because of the internet, I am strongly against ignoring the bigger problems out there and just teaching these half Sunday school myths because maybe because of who I am, but I have experienced too much disenfranchisement from the next generation. I have talked to too many people who have left the faith of our own children. And they say to me, we were taught lies. We were taught untruths. It's not correct what we were taught. Critics of Islam have been pointing out the gaping holes in the popular Islamic narrative for years. So why are some Muslim scholars starting to admit it now? It seems they don't have a choice. The internet has made the spread of information easier than ever, so it's getting harder and harder to keep people ignorant. A few are trying to get ahead of the curve and stop the avalanche of apostasy that is sure to arise as the information spreads. Kadi explains. There is a crisis going on in our community, and that crisis is our young men and women are leaving Islam by the droves. It's not talked about generally speaking, but it is happening across this country. One of the reasons these tab taboo topics are not talked about. To his credit, Kadi is honest enough to talk about difficult subjects. Most, however, will resort to the old techniques. Remember how I said Kadi did that interview for Hijab's channel? Well, something odd has happened. The hour and 48 minute long interview is now only one hour and 16 minutes long on Hijab's channel. Did a tame sheep eat it, perhaps? Nah, Hijab has removed all the sensitive material, trying to censor it from his audience and the comment section appears to have been scrubbed as well. But it doesn't stop there. As I noted, a number of critics have picked up and commented on the interview. Censorship jihadis are now flagging those videos as copyright violations and hate speech, in attempts to get them removed from YouTube. A decade ago, this took the form of physical violence. In the Dutch cartoon riots, for example, Muslim leaders incited violence against newspapers who published cartoons critical of Muhammad. More recently, terrorists targeted the newspaper Charlie Hebdo for doing the same. Nowadays, it's done online instead, with false flags in attempts to ruin reputations. It's common for critics of Islam to get strikes from obviously false flags on Facebook and Twitter. So much so that many critics have left those platforms. Either the platforms rely too heavily on automation, or people who work there are sympathetic to the Muslim cause and happy to censor people. To its credit, YouTube is usually better than the other social media giants. But this hasn't stopped Muslims from trying. A year ago, the largest Muslim channel, Merciful Servant, went so far as to publicly ask its subscribers to flag critics and try to have them blocked from the platform. 
Of course, there's nothing new here, as Islamic nations have been heavily censored and oppressive for centuries. And as we'll see in a moment, it goes all the way back to Muhammad himself. The only thing new is the Western world's awareness of the problem. Whether online or off, the intent is the same. Create a chilling effect that limits future criticism. If a newspaper is attacked, maybe others will think twice before criticizing Islam. If a YouTube channel is given a strike, as does happen sometimes, maybe it will start holding back. If it is shut down entirely, maybe others won't risk their livelihood by exposing the most obviously false prophet in history. Qadi still has the full interview up on his channel, but he's not immune to censorship either. He's disabled comments and is now filing false copyright claims to get videos exposing him removed. David Wood explains. Yesterday, I received this YouTube copyright takedown notification. Who ordered YouTube to take down my video? Yasser Qadi. Qadi claims that I violated his copyright. The problem for Qadi is that my video doesn't come within a thousand miles of violating his copyright because copyright law includes an exception for what's called fair use. Does Dr. Qadi know about fair use? Of course he does. He's a scholar. Every time a scholar quotes another person's book or lecture, he's relying on the doctrine of fair use. Even when Qadi doesn't censor himself, other Muslims are happy to censor him. Recently, someone alerted me that a link on my fastest growing religion video was dead. The cause? Qadi's famous video where he talks about past doubts about Islam has been removed from YouTube. And what caused Qadi to doubt? Learning facts at Yale that even the best Middle Eastern universities censor. Let's take a look. What, what the Western education does is it historicizes, contextualizes. Mm -hmm. It forces you to rethink. You know, Medina, Azhar, Malaysia, Islamabad will build a building for you. When you go to Harvard, Princeton, Yale, they will deconstruct the entire building. Throw it all the way back down. It's going to be all blocks. Back to Lego blocks. Then you have to figure out how am I going to reconstruct it myself. They're not even going to do it for you. Right? This is the reality of, of the Western education that you are forced to think and you realize that that building I inherited from Azhar or Medina is not a building that Allah revealed. It's a building that is constructed over centuries. Unfortunately, too much academics destroys the Qalb. <laughs> this is the Sufi in me speaking. <laughs> too much Aqlani stuff, it destroys the Qalb. It really does. Did you catch that last part? Rational learning destroys faith. The more you learn, the harder it is to make yourself believe that Islam is true, it seems. I can see why Muslims would want to censor this video. And apparently, the same Muslim censorship Qadi refers to is still prevalent, as he also talked about it in his interview with Hijab. These are now well known within the Western uh, Academy uh, that they're bringing forth issues. Their level of now knowledge is leaps and bounds above what it used to be, you know, 100 years ago, you know? and by and large, our ulama in the Eastern world are not aware, by and large, of what's going on in the Western side of things. Shabir Ali says something similar about facing censorship in the Muslim world. When I first uh, came out with some of my uh, revisions uh, of what I, I understood to be Islamic tradition, at first I was opposed severely. This was like in the year 2000 and around that time. Uh, there were mosques in which I used to preach uh, from which I felt myself cut off. There were um, conferences to which I used to uh, be invited. Suddenly I was no longer invited. And sometimes I was even disinvited. But why are all these Muslims so in love with censorship? Could it be because Islam has no truth to stand upon? Or maybe it runs even deeper. Maybe it's part of the very fabric of the religion. Let's look at a few examples from Muhammad's life, all taken from Islamic sources. Uzma bint Marwan used to criticize Muhammad in poetry. When he heard about this, Muhammad declared, Who will rid me of Marwan's daughter? Umayr heard him, and that very night he went to her house and killed her. 
In the morning he came to the apostle and told him what he had done. And he, meaning Muhammad, said, You have helped God and his apostle. al Nadar used to mock Muhammad, saying he was just repeating tales of the ancient and passing it off as revelation. This annoyed Muhammad so much that he revealed Surah 83.13 and had Nadar killed. When Allah allowed the Muslims to capture al Nadar in Badr, the Messenger of Allah commanded that his head be cut off before him. And that was done. All thanks are due to Allah. Fartana and Kareba were slave girls who made up satirical songs about Muhammad. And guess what happened to them? Abdullah bin Qatal had two singing girls, Fartana and another with her. The two used to sing satire about the messenger of God, so the latter commanded that the two of them should be killed along with him. And there are many more such examples. Those are critics, of course, but the faithful were encouraged to self-censure as well. The Prophet prohibited Muslims from persistent questioning and engaging in debates. He clarified, Allah kept silent about certain matters out of mercy, not forgetfulness, so do not delve into them. Those who were before you were destroyed because of excessive questioning and their opposition to their apostles, so when I command you to do anything, do it as much as it lies in your power, and when I forbid you to do anything, then abandon it. And the Quran agrees, discouraging thought and encouraging blind obedience. O oh, believers, question not concerning things which, if they were revealed to you, would vex you. A people before you questioned concerning them, then disbelieved. They will not believe till they make thee judge regarding the disagreement between them. Then they shall find in themselves no impediment touching thy verdict, but shall surrender in full submission. For these reasons, ignorance has become codified into Islamic law. In the Reliance of the Traveler, the most popular Sharia manual, we read, As for the basic obligation of Islam, and what relates to tenets of faith, it is adequate for one to believe in everything brought by the Messenger of Allah, and to credit it with absolute conviction free of doubt. Whoever does this is not obliged to learn the evidence of the scholastic theologians. What befits the common people and vast majority of those learning or possessing sacred knowledge is to refrain from discussing the subtleties of scholastic theology, lest corruption difficult to eliminate find its way into their basic religious convictions. Doubt is bad, and details of Islam might cause doubt, so best not to learn any. It gets worse. Our Imam Shafi'i went to the greatest possible lengths in asserting that engaging in scholastic theology is forbidden. He insistently emphasized its unlawfulness, the severity of the punishment awaiting those who engage in it, the disgrace of doing it, and the enormity of the sin therein, when he says, For a servant to meet Allah with any other sin than idolatry, shirk, is better than to meet him guilty of anything of scholastic theology. Likewise, non-Muslims aren't supposed to be given any access to Muslim texts. If a Quran is being purchased for someone, it is obligatory that the person be a Muslim. The same is true of the books of Hadith. This ruling holds for any religious books. So, we can see that ignorance and censorship run deep in Islam. But this isn't just a theoretical matter. It's ingrained to most Muslim children from a very early age. I've watched many testimonies of apostates, and most mention how they were taught to suppress their questions as a child. How Allah dislikes it when you ask questions, and how proper children don't do that. Instead, one suggests hear and obey, as a commenter on my channel loves to say. Indeed, Qadi says the same thing in Arabic. In a Muslim environment, we'll press a little bit, and then we'll say, okay, khalas, sami'na wa ta'na. And that's great. Don't ask if Islam is true. Just hear and obey. Don't ask why Allah violates the laws of logic and reason. Just hear and obey. 
Don't ask why Allah is clueless about the natural laws of his creation. Just hear and obey. Don't ask why the perfect example for all humanity to follow married a six-year-old girl and then raped her at nine. Just hear and obey. Don't ask why Allah wants you to wage war on non-Muslims. Just hear and obey. Fortunately, most people are unwilling to shut their brains off completely, even after a lifetime of indoctrination. That is why apostasy is rising and Muslim apologists are terrified. Without truth to turn to, what can they do but continue to lie and censor? Censorship is alive and well in much of the world, but fortunately, the internet is creating a freer world. Those who want truth no longer have to remain ignorant. One of the two pillars of Islamic scholarship is crumbling. Many common Muslims are reaching the first stage of knowledge. When you're the beginning, beginning student of knowledge, you're like, what is all of this going on here? Let's pray they don't simply suppress their doubts behind untestable ideas like Qadi ultimately did, but rather pursue truth wherever that may lead them. The true religion should stand up to scrutiny and not be afraid of any question. After 20 years of testing it, I can say with confidence that Christianity does just that. Thanks for watching.